There we go. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lahu wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Amma ba'd my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you tonight for this final class of Kitab al-Wahi from Sahih al-Bukhari, where we will be taking the final hadith in this chapter, which depending on the version that you're following, will either be hadith number six or hadith number seven. So just as a reminder, I will be sharing the link in the chat. So the link is sunnah.com forward slash Bukhari forward slash one, and then go to the very last hadith, go to the very last hadith that is reported by Abdullah ibn Abbas in the link that I shared, it is actually hadith number seven. It is actually hadith number seven. And I also want to share with you today this phenomenal book that I have found here in Toronto. It's called Commentary on Sahil Bukhari. And this is volume one, which covers Kitab al-Wahi and Kitab al-Iman. And this is by Sheikh uh, Umar Subidar. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, jazahullah khairan. It's uh, an absolutely tremendous and amazing work. So those of you that have been joining us Throughout the weeks, we've normally been using sunnah.com. But today, insha'Allah ta'ala, I'm going to be using the translation from uh, Sheikh Omar Subidar uh, because you'll see that it is vastly superior to the one that is available. It is vastly superior to the one that is available. So as I mentioned, this is a long hadith. We're going to read it together once and then we'll do uh, some brief explanation over it. And the key interesting fact is, you know, why is this hadith actually in here? Why did Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah choose this hadith, and then we'll do a recap of all of the ahadith bin Allahi ta'ala. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah reported that Abu Sufyan ibn Harb uh, radiallahu anhu told him that Heraclius sent for him while he was in a caravan of the Quraysh. They were doing business in a sham during the period when Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had made a truce with Abu Sufyan and the non-believers of the Quraysh. So they went to Heraclius while they were in Jerusalem. Heraclius called them before his assembly where he, where he was surrounded by the, uh, by the Byzantine dignitaries. He called them, called for his interpreter, and asked, which one of you is the closest relative to the man who claims to be a prophet? Abu Sufyan said, I am. Among us, I am his closest relative. Heraclius then instructed, bring him here to me. Also bring his companions here and place them behind him. He then said to his interpreter, tell them, I will ask this man questions about the man who claims to be a prophet. If he lies to me, they must expose his lie. So quick pause over here. So Heraclius has summoned the Quraysh to his court now. And from amongst those people is Abu Sufyan. And the people that are with Abu Sufyan are lined up behind Abu Sufyan. And Abu Sufyan is in front conversing alone. But the people that are behind can hear everything that Abu Sufyan is saying. And Heraclius instructs them that if he lies about anything, point out his lie. Do not let him get away with it. So now we continue. And then um, he says, if he lies, they must expose his lie. Abu Sufyan explains to Abdullah bin Abbas. So now this is Abu Sufyan commenting on his own words. He says, I swear to Allah that I would have definitely lied about him, meaning about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had there been no risk of me becoming embarrassed by them telling others that I lied. So Abu Sufyan over here is telling Abdullah bin Abbas after the fact that, you know, had it not been for embarrassment, I would have lied against the Prophet because Abu Sufyan is not Muslim at this point. Abu Sufyan, he converts to Islam later on uh, at the, the Fath of Mecca, or after the Fath of Mecca rather. And he's just saying that at that time as a non-Muslim, I would have lied against the Prophet if I didn't fear embarrassment, if I didn't fear embarrassment. So the first question Heraclius asks uh, me about him was, what is his lineage like amongst you? I replied, he is of noble descent among us. He asked, has any one of your people ever made this claim of prophethood before him? I replied, no. He asked, were any of his ancestors a king? I answered, no. He asked, do the nobles of society follow him or its weak people? I replied, rather its weak people. He asked, are they increasing or decreasing? I said, actually, they are increasing. He asked, has any one of them left due to becoming disappointed with their religion? 
after entering it? I replied, no. He asked, have you ever suspected him of lying before he declared what he declared? I answered, no. He then asked, does he betray? I answered, no. However, we are currently in a period of truce with him. We have no knowledge of what he is doing during this period. Abu Sufyan mentioned, it was impossible for me to utter any other words besides these. What, he's meaning, what he means over here is, you know, obviously he can't lie against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but him saying that we don't know what he's planning, we don't know what he's plotting right now, that was the closest thing that he could convey to a lie to sort of try to uh, tarnish the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he asked, have you, have you people faced him in battle? I replied, yes. He asked, how were your battles with him? I explained, war between us with him has its ups and downs. Sometimes he hurts us and sometimes we hurt him. He asked, what instructions does he give you? I replied, he says, worship Allah alone and do not associate anything with him in his divinity. Abandon what your ancestors have said. He orders us to pray, to speak the truth, to be chaste, and to keep good connections with our relatives. After this, Heraclius said to the interpreter, tell him, I asked about his lineage and you said he was of noble descent among you. Likewise, messengers of the divine come from noble lineage of their family. I asked you, has any one of you ever made such a claim? And you replied, no. I thought to myself, if anyone had made this claim before him, I would have concluded that he is a man who is merely copying a claim that was made before him. I asked you, was any of his ancestors a king? And you replied, no. So I thought in my mind, if any of his ancestors was a king, I would have said that he is a man pursuing the kingdom of his ancestor. I asked you, have you ever suspected him of lying before he declared what he declared? And you replied, no. So I realized that he would not refrain from lying. So, so I realized that he would not refrain from lying about people and begin to lie about Allah. I also asked you, do the nobles of society follow him or its weak people? So you mentioned that the weak are following him. Typically, they are the followers of the messengers. I also asked you, are they increasing or decreasing? And you said they are increasing. Such is the state of faith until it is perfected. I asked you, has anyone left due to becoming disappointed with their religion after having entered it? And you replied, no. Such is Iman when, it, when its joy mixes with people's hearts. I also asked, does he betray? And you replied, no. Such are the messengers of Allah. They do not betray. I also asked, what instructions does he give you? And you said that he instructs you to worship Allah and to associate nothing with him. He forbids you from worshiping idols, orders you to pray, to speak the truth, and to be chaste. If what you say is true, he shall soon control the land under my very feet. Truly, I knew that he was going to emerge I never suspected that he would be from your people. If I knew I could travel to him, I would surely venture to meet him. And if I were with him, I would definitely wash his feet. After that, Heraclius asked for the letter from Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which the Messenger sent with Dihya al-Kalbi to the governor of Busra, who then forwarded it to Heraclius. He then read it out. Surprisingly, in it was the following. I begin with the name of Allah, the merciful, the ever merciful. This is a letter from Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger to the great Heraclius of the Byzantine Empire. Peace be to those who follow, follow divine guidance. After these opening remarks, truly, I extend the invitation of Islam to you. Embrace Islam and you will be safe. And Allah will grant you your reward in twofold. Should you turn away, the sin of Yadisin will be upon you. People of the scripture, come to words that are common between us and you, that we will only worship Allah and not associate anything with him, and that none of us take others as divine masters besides Allah. But if they turn away, then bear witness that we are Muslims. Abu Sufyan continued, after Heraclius said what he said to, had to say and finished reading out the letter, shouting arose around him, voices were raised, and we were ushered out. I then said to my companions when we were taken out, Ibn Abi Kabshah's affair has become so significant that even the king of the Caucasians fears him. After that, I remained convinced that he would soon become triumphant until Allah instilled Islam in me. Ibn al-Natur, who was the governor of Jerusalem while Heraclius was the archbishop of the Christians in Sham, 
reported one morning while Heraclius was visiting Jerusalem, he woke up in a bad mood. Some of his officers spoke up. You do not look normal to us today. Ibn al-Natur continued, Heraclius was an astrologer who would look into the stars. He then replied to them since they asked him, last night when I looked into the stars, I saw that the leader of the people who practice circumcision will surely become triumphant. Who practices circumcision in this community? They replied, no one practices circumcision except for the Jews. Do not let their affair be of concern to you. Issue letters to the leaders of the cities in your empire to kill the Jews who live there. While they were discussing this matter, a man was brought to Heraclius who was sent by the king of Ghassan to convey the news of Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once Heraclius collected information from him, he ordered, take him and check, whatever he, uh, check whether he is circumcised or not. So they checked him and informed Heraclius that he was circumcised. Heraclius asked the man about the Arabs, so he told him they practice circumcision. Heraclius then said, it is the leader of this very nation who will surely become victorious. After that, Heraclius wrote a letter to his friend in Rome who was, who was as knowledgeable as him. Heraclius went to the city of Hems and remained there until a reply came to him from his friend, concurring with Heraclius' opinion that the Prophet ﷺ had arrived and that Muhammad was indeed a prophet. Heraclius then summoned the dignitaries of the Byzantine Empire to his palace in Hems. He then ordered that its gates be locked so that so they were locked. Then he emerged and said, Romans, do you wish to achieve success? Be rightly guided. Keep your empire firm. They ple then pledge allegiance to this prophet. Upon hearing this, they all ran to the gates like wild donkeys, only to find them locked. When Heraclius saw their aversion to Islam and lost all hope in their adopting this faith, he ordered, bring them back to me. When they returned, he said, whatever I just said, it was so that I could test your religious conviction. Now I have truly seen it. Then they prostrated to him and were pleased with him. That was the last attempt made by Heraclius. And that is the end of the hadith. Allahu Akbar. As I mentioned, it was a very long hadith and I apologize um, you know, if I was monotonous or did not need it, read it as enthusiastically um, to keep you engaged. But uh, there is so much to cover in that hadith. So firstly, let's start off with the historical context over here. The historical context prior to this letter, the Persians and the Byzantine Empire were at war. And the area that they were fighting over was actually a sham, inclusive of al bayt al-Maqdis and Jerusalem and Philistine. So they were fighting over this land. And the Persians had taken control over it up and until around 629, up and until around 629. Then the Roman Empire, by being with the, the help of the, of, of the Byzantine Empire, got control of it again, got control of it again. And that is why Heraclius has come to Philistine now. Heraclius has come to Philistine. During this time, the Prophet wasallam has sent a letter to the king of Ghassan, has sent a letter to the king of Ghassan to forward on to the Roman Empire, inviting them to Islam, inviting them to Islam. So during this time, Heraclius, who is in uh, Jerusalem or in Philistine at this time, he says, go out into the marketplace and find me someone from amongst the Arabs. And Abu Sufyan and some of the Quraysh, they just happened to be there, subhanAllah, on a business trip. They just happened to be there on a business trip. So this is where the hadith starts off, that Abu Sufyan and, the, and his entourage are brought to the front of uh, the court of Heraclius, to the front of the court of Heraclius. That is the historical context. Now, why does Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, include this hadith in the book of Revelation? Why does he include this hadith in the book of Revelation? Two primary reasons. Reason number one is to mention the similarities of the message of all of the prophets and messengers to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to associate no partners with him. Like the very first ayah that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah mentions in Kitab al-Wahi, then this hadith in its conclusion is the exact same message. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and do not associate any partners with him. This was the reoccurring theme of all the prophets and messengers. And this is the crux of wahi. This is the crux of why revelation came down so that mankind may worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. You look at the very first command in the Quran that we find in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
يا ايها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون that all oh, you who believe um, or sorry all oh, mankind have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who has created you and those before you um, all, all mankind worship the one who has created you and those before you in hopes that you may attain taqwa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so now this shows us the consistency of the message uh, throughout revelation whether it be the Quran, whether it be the Torah, whether it be the Injil, or any other revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down. Number two, it talks about how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had signs that were sent to the previous nations to recognize the Quran, to recognize the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are known as the characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then number three, and this is indirectly tied to it, the impact that wahi can have subhanallah so here you have abu sufyan who is not muslim when this incident happened but he eventually ends up accepting islam then you have heraclius who has all of this knowledge about islam and has all of this knowledge about prophethood and has all of this knowledge about scripture yet subhanallah he doesn't ex end up accepting islam and is there a difference of opinion on that we'll we'll speak about that shortly so these are some of the reasons why imam al-bukhari rahimahullah included this hadith under Kitabul Wahi and especially as the last hadith, especially as the last hadith. So now the very first question that he asks uh, the, the group that are there, who is the closest relative to this man that claims to be a prophet? And that is when Abu Sufyan is brought forth. So the wisdom behind him asking who is the closest man, because you usually know your relatives best. You know, at that time, families are very close. They're very tribalistic. In fact, there was this um, famous saying or, or adage you could say, "Ana wa akhi al ibn ammi, ana wa ibn ammi al gharib." That this is the, the tribalistic nature that exists. Subhanallah. You know, me and my brother against my cousin, and then me and my cousin against the stranger. So those ties of kinship, you know, they kept very very close ties, and they have allegiance based upon family. They have allegiance based upon family. And that is why he asked who was the closest family member and Abu Sufyan came forward and Abu Sufyan came forward. And the way that they are uh, related to one another is through Abdul Manaf. So Abu Sufyan and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are related through Abdul Manaf. Now later on, Abu Sufyan actually becomes the father-in-law of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marries Um Habiba. So that's a second relationship that is established that is a second relationship that is established so that is the relationship between the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and abu sufyan and abu sufyan then abu sufyan he goes on to say to tell abdullah ibn abbas radiallahu anhum over here that you know if i didn't fear embarrassment i would have lied against the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this shows us that even though they were from the quraysh and even though they did things that were wrong there was still a sense of retaining one's reputation retaining one's honor, retaining one's dignity. And Abu Sufyan wanted to keep that intact. He wanted to keep that intact. He didn't want to lose it, even though at that time he detested the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So reputation, honor, and dignity was very, very important. Now, why is that significant? Because when the Fatah of Makkah happens, how does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam honor Abu Sufyan? He says that whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan will be safe. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan will be safe. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ honored him. And this is perhaps a sign of how the Prophet ﷺ knew that honor and dignity was very important to Abu Sufyan. And if he gave that to him, then perhaps that would incline his heart to accept Islam. It would incline his heart to accept Islam. So then he, uh, Heraclius now goes on to the questions, telling the people behind him that if he lies, point out his lie. His very first question, what is his descent like amongst you? He said he is of noble descent, meaning that the Prophet Sallallahu came of a pure lineage. And the vast majority of prophets all came from pure lineages. In fact, there's a beautiful hadith when the Prophet Sallallahu was asked, who has the best lineage? Who has the best lineage? And he says, Yusuf salam, that Yusuf, the son of a prophet, the son of a prophet, the son of the Khalil of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. So Yusuf, the son of Yaqub, the son of Ishaq, the son of Ibrahim, Khalilullah, alayhim as salatu was salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send salah and salam upon them all. So 
it's, it's, it's interesting to see that the prophets and messengers came from noble lineage. So there is that precursor, that pre-telling that they are coming from pure lineage. Uh, and this was a consistent uh, thing throughout all of history, a consistent thing throughout all of history. Then he asks, has any of them left due to becoming disappointed with the religion after entering it? So he's asking, do people enter into Islam and then leave it? Or do they remain within the faith? Do they re remain within the faith? Now, let's understand this question because I think it becomes very, very pertinent. Do people leave Islam? Yes, it happens all the time. Interestingly enough, the son-in-law of Abu Sufyan, Ubaidullah ibn Jash, the husband of Um Habiba, he actually left Islam. He was a, a, a Sahabi who made the Hijrah to Abyssinia and for worldly reasons, he ended up accepting Christianity and ended up leaving Islam. And Abu Sufyan knew this. So when he's asked this question, he understands from the context, it's not that people will never leave Islam, but people will never leave Islam for religious reasons because they found a religion more superior to it. That is not why people leave Islam, but they will leave for worldly reasons or they will leave for other reasons, not because they found a religion or a way of life superior to Islam. And there's a point coming on later on where we talk about the importance of believers tasting the sweetness of certainty, tasting the sweetness of Iman, that when you taste that, that is what retains your faith. But if you never reach that level where you've tasted the sweetness of Iman, then that becomes something dangerous. So it is something that you should be striving for. It is something that you should be striving for. Then Heraclius asks, have you ever suspected him of lying before he declared what he declared? And this was a very comprehensive question, basically wanting to see, did the Prophet wasallam prior to Risala ever lie? And then we all know the famous story of he is uh, the truthful one. He is Al-Amin, the trustworthy one. And thus he was chosen to place the Hajr al-Aswad back into the uh, corner of the Kaaba, right? Because of his honesty and his reputable uh, persona that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was honest and trustworthy. And there's no way that Abu Sufyan could have answered yes to that because it was too well known that he was honest and trustworthy. He was honest and trustworthy. Then he asks, does he ever betray? Meaning that if he makes a promise, if he has a covenant and a treaty with you, does he ever betray you? And then we saw what Abu Sufyan did. We saw what Abu Sufyan did. He says, no, but right now we're at a truce with him and we don't know what he's going to do. So the truth that he's referring to is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So now this gives further context as to the timeline of when all of this is taking place. So we know it's after the Hijrah, after several years. You can imagine around the sixth year of the Hijrah or so, seventh year of the Hijrah or so, just around that time. So during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. What's fascinating is that there's another version of this hadith as well that brings in a very particular nuance. It brings in a very particular nuance. This is the version of Urwa. This is the version of Urwa. And Abu Sufyan's attempt to taint the uh, character of the Prophet ﷺ bore no fruit. Instead, it backfired. According to Urwa's report, Heraclius further inquired, what is it that you fear during this truce? So he's asking, we don't, he's, when he said, we don't know what he's going to do during, during this truce, he asked him, what is it that you fear? And Abu Sufyan explained, my people supported our allies against his allies. Upon this, Heraclius expressed, if you have started the trouble, then you are the greatest of betrayers. Then you are the greatest of betrayers. And this is referring to the onset of what led to the Fath of Makkah. What led to the Fath of Makkah is that the allies of the Muslims were attacked by the allies of the Quraysh and the Quraysh aided those, their allies to attack the allies of the Muslims. And that is what led to the Fath of Makkah. So this is what the uh, incident is referring to. Then Heraclius goes on to ask him, have you ever faced him in battle? He replied, yes. How are those battles? Sometimes we harm him, sometimes he harms us. This is referring to the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at both these battles, clearly the Battle of Badr was a victory for the Muslims. But did the Quraysh win the Battle of Uhud? I think this is a matter of perspective. Because in reality, what happened was it, not, it was not that the Quraysh were superior. It was that the Muslims didn't stick to their plan. The archers were supposed to stay in a particular area. 
yet they got too attracted by the dunya and they left their posts and thus was an act of, it was an act of self sabotage it wasn't that the Quraysh became superior so i think that's very interesting wording that abu sufyan uses over here that sometimes we harm him and sometimes he harms us then he goes on to say and this is you know the, the main thing that we mentioned as to why imam al bukhari rahimahullah mentioned uh, this hadith he asked what instructions does he give you and subhanallah it is amazing that even though wahi has continuously been coming down for you know several years now you can imagine almost like 17 18 years now wahi is coming down to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he's conveying it to the quraysh and through all of this wahi he understands it so well that he can succinctly put it into a message that he commands us to worship allah alone and to not associate any partners with him he orders us to establish the prayer he orders us to be truthful and he orders us to be chaste subhanallah these characteristics and these qualities these he was able to summarize into one paragraph he was able to summarize into one paragraph and again you will see that this is a reoccurring theme with previous scriptures that all of the scriptures from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command these commonalities to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone to associate with no partners to establish the salah to be honest and uh, truthful and to remain chaste and to remain chaste and then he adds over here to abandon what your ancestors have said and this is the asabiyah and qawmiyah that was so prevalent that subhanallah we saw this during abu talib you know when he passes away that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is begging and pleading with him that oh abu talib just say this one word say this one word so that i can have some sort of proof and stance and ground in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your behalf just say la ilaha illallah that's all you have to do but the people put so much social pressure, so much emotional blackmail, saying things like, are you going to abandon the way of your father, the way of their father, and the way of their fathers, the, meaning that your forefathers and your ancestry? Are you going to abandon this legacy that has been passed forth? How dare you? How could you do that? And this was the type of you know, emotional blackmail they were putting on Abu Talib. And that is why perhaps the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to emphasize this so much that if you blindly follow your ancestors without questioning, without looking for truth yourself, without questioning, you know, what is truth and how do I, um, you know, act upon it, you will be led astray. You will be led astray. And this is why even in the Quran itself, we find verses of uh, conversations that will happen on the Day of Judgment where people will say that, Oh Allah, give our forefathers and our ancestry and our leaders from amongst them double the punishment because they led us astray because they led us astray so now after this heraclius goes on to tell the interpreter to tell him i asked you about his lineage and you said that he is noble amongst you likewise messengers of divine lineage came from that community and he's explaining now why he asked all of these questions why he asked all of these questions and i think all of that was pretty straightforward all of that was pretty straightforward now we get to this ikhtilaf did heraclius ever uh, embrace islam did heraclius ever enter islam al hafiz ibn abdul bar uh, and others uh, were of the view that heraclius became muslim so there is a minority opinion that he did become muslim but the conclusive evidence points to the fact that he did not and it's a, a long story i'm not going to go through it but eventually heraclius writes a letter to the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying that i have accepted islam and the Prophet ﷺ tells the congregation he is lying, rather he is still firm on his Christian faith. He is still firm on his Christian faith. And Al-Hafid ibn Hajar reports this in Fathul Bari. He reports this in Fathul Bari. So Heraclius never actually ended up accepting Islam. And I think by the end of this, by the conclusion of this hadith, you even realize that himself. That he was too afraid to lose his position, too afraid to face his people. And when they prostrated to him, he didn't stop them. When they prostrated to him, he didn't stop them. So that is the summary of did Heraclius accept Islam or not. After that, Heraclius asked for the letter from Allah's Messenger وسلم, which was sent with Dehya al-Kalbi to the governor of Busra, meaning the uh, Ghassanid Empire. And he actually reads out the letter. Now the letter begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And as we talked about in the first hadith class, in writing, you begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in presenting, in um, giving khutbahs and sermons, 
you always begin by uh, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salah and salam upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The letter clearly states who it is from. It says that it is from Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger. So always identify who you are and what your role is. To the great Heraclius of the Byzantine Empire, addressing him with honor and nobility. Then he goes on to say, peace be to those who follow this divine guidance. This is the famous phrase, As-salamu ala man al-huda, that peace be upon those who follow true guidance. And this leads us to a fiqh discussion. Are Muslims allowed to give salams to non-Muslims? Initiate salams to non-Muslims. The vast majority of the scholars are of the opinion that no, you are not allowed to initiate salams to non-Muslims, meaning you are not allowed to say assalamu alaikum to them. You're not allowed to say assalamu alaikum to them. Some of the scholars said that there is room for exception if you are trying to familiarize them with Islam and there is a greater benefit, then you are allowed to say assalamu alaikum to them. So what is the alternative? If you cannot say assalamu alaikum to them, then what is the alternative? You are allowed to say assalamu ala man ittaba al huda that pray that peace be upon those who follow true guidance. Peace be upon those who follow true guidance. What is the wisdom behind the statement? If you've ever been to a fundraiser, and I know 27th night is coming up tomorrow night, so some of you may actually be in a fundraiser, you'll find that the fundraiser will say, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant Jannah to the first person to donate. And then you'll see that riles something in your heart because you want to be included in that dua, don't you? You want to be the person that gets Jannah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're inclined towards, okay, you know what? I'm going to donate. Similarly over here, when you say, Assalamu ala man ittaba al huda that peace be upon those who follow true guidance, the aims and the hope is that something in your heart will click and say that I want to receive that peace. I want to be whole. I want to, to you know, receive the salutation from the salutations of, of, of paradise. So therefore, I need to follow true guidance. Therefore, I need to follow true guidance. So that is the psychological wisdom behind saying, As-salamu ala man ittaba al-huda, that it will incite something in their heart that they want to attain peace and attain this greeting of paradise. Now, how about if a non-believer initiates salams to you? A non-Muslim says, Assalamu alaikum, are you allowed to respond? The ikhtilaf over here is greater. The ikhtilaf over here is greater, meaning you have more numbers that said it is allowed. You have more numbers that said it is allowed. Generally, you would just say, wa alaikum, upon you be what you wished for me. But others have said you are allowed to say, wa alaikum as -salam. And this is based upon the verse in Surah An-Nisa, that when you're greeted with a greeting, then respond with that which is equal or that which is greater. So you respond with that which is equal. The safer opinion still is just to say wa alaikum and to leave it at that. So that is the ikhtilaf with regards to the salams and non-Muslims. So then the Prophet ﷺ in this letter, he says, embrace Islam and you will be safe and Allah will grant you your reward in twofold. He will grant you a reward in twofold. And subhanAllah, it's as if the Prophet ﷺ knows what is in the heart of Heraclius. That Heraclius wants to retain his position and, you know, he wants to embrace the truth as well. And this is why he's telling him that if you embrace Islam, then you will get your reward twofold. In this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow you to keep your position and in the hereafter, you will be from the saved. You will be from the saved. But eventually, he didn't end up accepting Islam. Eventually, he didn't end up accepting Islam. And what ended up happening? He ended up losing his position. He ended up losing his position. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, should you turn away, the sin of the of the Yarisin will be upon you. The word Yarisin is plural of Yaris, and they are the uh, Syriac farmers, and they are the people um, whom Heraclius used uh, to oversee. They are the people that Heraclius used to oversee. Then Allah's Messenger وسلم, he includes the verse uh, from Surah Al-Imran, verse number 64, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa." That, O oh, people of the book, come to a common word between you and I. Come to a common word between you and I. That we will only worship Allah and we will not take as um, others, um, as, as those that we, that we worship. Uh, and then if they turn away, then testify that we are surely from the believers. And testify that we are surely from the believers. Now, 
This brings us to a, a question. Are non-Muslims allowed to touch the Quran? And the answer as a whole is that no, non-Muslims should not be touching the Quran, meaning the Quran in Arabic, void of any translation and any further explanation. Non-Muslims should not be touching that. Non-Muslims should not be touching that. And that is why the Prophet Wasallam forbade taking the Quran to Dar al-Kufr, to the lands of disbelief. Now, in this letter, it's not just Quran. It is a letter from the Prophet Wasallam, and thus it is allowed. Similarly, if there's a translation or an explanation, then a non-Muslim is allowed. Then a non-Muslim is allowed to do that. And that leads us to other discussions. Okay, then how about a Muslim that is Junab? Or how about a Muslim that is not in the state of Tahara? And then we would differentiate over here between the Quran and that writing which is inclusive of the Quran, but there's more to it. And the conclusion is, if that writing is more than just the Quran, like explanation, like part of a greater letter, then yes, you are allowed to touch it. Then yes, you are allowed to touch it. If it is only the Quran, then one has to be Tahir. One has to be Tahir in order to uh, touch the Quran. So this is uh, why this is relevant is because obviously that uh, letter had a verse from the Quran in it. Now, what is really important and pertinent over here is that the Prophet Sallallahu invited these people to Islam and didn't wage war against these people, right? Contrary to common belief in, in the West that Islam was spread by the sword, here we have a clear example that it wasn't spread by the sword. Here we have a clear example that it wasn't spread by the sword. The Prophet Sallallahu sent this letter to him, inviting him to Islam, inviting him to Islam. In fact, when you look at this letter, the Prophet Sallallahu avoids using language that would of, of, um, you know, offend uh, Heraclius. He presented himself as Muhammad, Allah's servant and messenger, did it himself as a grandiose title. He greeted uh, Heraclius with peace, saying that peace be upon those that follow true guidance. He delivered a very brief and concise message. He touched upon the consequences of declining Islam and also mentioned the virtues and the rewards of accepting Islam. And then he mentions a verse from the Quran, meaning from direct scripture from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, that is the conclusion of the first part of the hadith. The first part of the hadith is now concluded. And then uproar takes place in the court uh, room. And Abu Sufyan and his entourage are escorted out. And you'll notice that he says something very interesting over here. He says that the affair of Ibn Abi Kabsha has become so significant that even the king of the Caucasians has now started to fear him. So Ibn Abi Kabsha, he was actually someone from the Quraysh that abandoned the way of the forefathers, meaning that he stopped worshipping idols. But who, who did he worship instead? He started worshiping the, worshiping the stars. So he became known as a social outcast. And thereafter, anyone that was a social outcast became known as Ibn Abi Kabsha. So he referred to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Ibn Abi, Abi Kabsha as a social outcast and mentioned how Heraclius was now even afraid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he mentions the profound point about his acceptance of Islam. He says, after that, I remain convinced that the Prophet ﷺ would become triumphant. Meaning that once I saw that even Heraclius was shaken up by this letter, I knew that Islam was going to be triumphant and that Allah would eventually instill Islam in my heart. Allahu Akbar. He would eventually instill Islam in my heart. And then we see um, Abu Sufyan you know, end up accepting Islam um, after the, the Fatah of Makkah. And he actually played a very, very pivotal role in the Fatah of Makkah, it's something definitely worthwhile looking into. Definitely worthwhile looking into. Now, the second part of the hadith just talks about what happened thereafter. So Ibn Natur, he continued that Heraclius was an astrologer who looked into the stars. And subhanAllah, I don't know what he saw in the stars, but somehow, some way, he saw that the people who are circumcised would become triumphant. And at that time, the only people that were known to be circumcised were the Jewish people, were the Jewish people. So what was the response to their entourage that the way you prevented this from happening, kill all Jewish people? SubhanAllah. So if you look at anti-Semitism, you know, its roots go way, way back, way, way back. And, you know, this is something that we see thereafter. But eventually they realize that, you know what? It's not just Jewish people that are circumcised, but it is also the Muslims and the Arabs as well. It is also the Muslims and the Arabs as well. And SubhanAllah, you know, the messenger that came, they actually uncovered him to see if he was uncircumcised or not. You can imagine how humiliating that is uh, to be in that position. But it shows you at that time that, you know, 
this side didn't have that honor, didn't have uh, that dignity and respect. And they um, uncovered the, the messenger in that way. Um, then the, the, the last part goes that while they were discussing this matter, a man came to Heraclius who was sent by the king of Assan to convey the news of Allah's messenger. And that's uh, the messenger that we spoke about. And then the last part of the hadith is that Heraclius, um, you know, invites all of the, the dignitaries to come and visit him when he's in Hems, right? So he's confirmed all this information with his friend who is just as knowledgeable as him, as we covered. And now he's convinced in his heart that Islam is the truth and this is the messenger of Allah and that we should follow him. But he doesn't want to lose his seat. He doesn't want to lose his power, subhanAllah. So he invites all of the dignitaries to him so where he is and he closes off the gates and he says, oh people of Rome, if you want to remain, keep your status and you want to remain firm um, and you want to be successful, then worship this, uh, sorry, follow the religion of this man, follow the religion of this man. And the people uproared and they ran towards the gates like wild donkeys, subhanAllah, as the hadith mentions. And eventually he summons them back and says, I was just texting your conviction. Then they made sajda to him, and that was the end of the affair. That was the end of the affair. And several years later, uh, in 641, Heraclius died as a disbeliever, and this was the opinion of the majority of scholars. This was the opinion of the majority of scholars. And that brings us to the conclusion of this hadith. So now we've looked at why Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah mentioned this hadith inside Sahih al-Bukhari. Let's do a quick recap. Let's do a quick recap of everything that we've taken bithnillahi ta'ala. So it, the, the chapter starts off with قول الله عز وجل إن أوحينا إليك كما أوحينا إلى نوح والنبيين من بعده. So just before hadith number one begins, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah mentions this verse from the Quran that we have revealed to you just like we revealed to Nuh and the prophets before you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is a continuation of the previous prophets. And they received the same message. And they received the same message. Now, why does Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, and this is something we didn't touch upon, why does Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah begin with the book of Revelation? Why not begin with Kitab al-Tawheed? Why not begin with the book of Prophet? Why not begin with something else? Because Wahi is the source of all goodness. Wahi is the source of all guidance. And thus, if it is the first foundation, then you have to begin by building your building blocks. So the Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah begins with Kitab al-Wahi to establish this foundation. Then we spoke about why Imam al-Bukhari includes the hadith of إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ to show that the sunnah is a part of revelation as well. So after he mentions the ayah, he brings the hadith that even the sunnah is a part of revelation. And we talked about the beautiful uh, chain of narration over here where all of the chain of narrators were from the lands of revelation, either from Mecca or Medina or from both of them. And how Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah gave preference to the Quraysh implementing a hadith that he mentioned in his own sahih by using the hadith of al-Humaydi Abdullah bin Zubair um, as the very first hadith in this book. Then they hear, then in hadith number two, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, we see that uh, it speaks about how revelation used to come down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the different shapes and, and forms that it used to took and how great of an impact that it used to have and how Jibreel sometimes would recite it or implant it in the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In hadith number three, we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started having good dreams and we spoke about the 146th and where that actually came from. And as this happened, we spoke about all of the signs pre-Prophethood that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, received, like the opening of his chest, as a child, like the clouds that used to give him shade, um, like him not being able to do uh, the, 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 the sins of, the, of his people and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected his integrity and he was known as a truthful and honest one. And then uh, he started seeing true dreams. So these were all precursors which led him to be more contemplative. Why is all of this happening? In which he used to isolate himself in the cave of Hera. And then we spoke about the first revelation, which was Iqra from Surah Al-Alaq. And this was not uh, a clear-cut opinion in early Islam, but rather through the work of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah and establishing these chain of narrations and establishing this chronological historical context, it pretty much became consensus thereafter that Iqra was the first revelation and Surah Al-Muddathir was the second, was the second. 
Then the next one talks about how Surah Al-Mudathir came uh, down. That's hadith number four. And hadith number five on how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to try to preserve revelation by constantly repeating it, by constantly repeating it. And how there was so much due diligence involved in conveying hadith, in conveying hadith. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he tells Sayyid ibn Jubair, this is how I heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is how I saw him move his lips. And Sayyid ibn Jubair, he tells his students that this is how I saw Abdullah ibn Abbas عنهما, move his lips. So the teacher of hadith teaches through the example as well. And this is why the science of passing on Quran and passing on hadith is such a meticulous science that uh, requires due diligence, subhanAllah. You have to pay very close uh, attention to it and you have to have the highest in level of integrity and precision, subhanAllah. So that is hadith number five. And then hadith number six, according to this version, it talks about the impact that revelation had upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that it would make him the most generous. Uh, and then in the month of Ramadan, and also how he used to revise the Quran with Jibreel in Ramadan. How he used to revise the Quran in Ramadan with Jibreel. And then which brings us to the last hadith, which we covered today. So that is a summary of all of the hadith that we have taken. And that is the conclusion of Kitab al-Wahi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from us and from you. Anything that I've said that is correct is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all praise is due to him alone. And anything that I've said that is incorrect is from myself and shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me and all of you. Allahumma ameen. With that being said, inshallah, we can open up the floor uh, for questions for those of you that are inside the classroom chat. And I will respond to the salams of whoever I see. So I see Muhammadi Murtaza Siddiqui, wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Sarah A, wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Sheila, as salam wa alaikum. One of Allah's creation, as salam wa alaikum. And then we have, okay, um, subhanAllah, it's going too fast. I can't keep up. Uh, where did we go? We have Niyanun Nahar Salam. Oh, you said the hadith beautifully. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. And then we have Amin, Jazakallah Khair, Jazakallah Khair, Jazakallah Khair, Salam from Mu'mina Mustaqeem. All of you saying Salams and Jazakumullah Khairan wa Iyakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Who was the king of Ghassan and his messenger? So the messenger was the Fatir. Um, I don't remember the name of the, the king of Ghassan. Please forgive me, subhanAllah. The, the name, uh, skip, actually, I, I don't think I ever knew it. I, I don't think I looked it up. Uh, if I did, I have forgotten it. Uh, but the messenger that was sent was the Fatir. The messenger that was sent was the Fatir. Uh, ben, thank you for this beautiful class. Thank you. Noor, is this our last meeting? Yes. So Kitab al-Wahi from Sahih al-Bukhari is concluded. And with Allah Ta'ala, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us life and tawfiq, then we begin with Kitab al-Ilm. We will begin, uh, sorry, Kitab al-Iman. We will begin with Kitab al-Iman. Uh, bin Allah Ta'ala, perhaps at another time. Perhaps at another time. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask your questions, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Was the king of Ghassan from among the Muslims or the Byzantines? From the Byzantines, he was Christian. The king of Ghassan was Christian. And for those of you that came late, uh, I'd, uh, I'd mentioned that I found this new book, which is absolutely great. Commentary on Sahel Bukhari, uh, the book of Revelation and the book of Belief. Um, by Sheikh Omar Subidar. It's a great, great book. So those of you that are interested in studying more, this is a great starting point in the English language. It's a great starting point in the English language. And then there was also a uh, blog uh, called Bukhari Explanation. I, I'm not sure who was running that blog, but I want to say it was Sheikh Muntasir uh, Zaman. My heart is inclining towards that. It seems like his work. Uh, that's another great resource as well that you can refer to. Um, there are some spelling mistakes here and there, uh, but you know you can overlook those. Inshallah, it's still a valuable. Does the the book also have the Arabic hadith? Yes, it does. Uh, so let me show show it to you, Inshallah, so you can see what it is like. And I, as I mentioned, this the translation over here I find vastly superior to the translation that's available um, in uh, on the internet in Sunnah.com. So you'll see that the Arabic uh, is mentioned with the English. So this is the first verse that Imam al-Bukhari uh, brings inside the Sahih. So that's an example of the verse. Then you have an example of 
the hadith itself. So you have the Arabic and the English, the Arabic and the English. So yes, both of them are included. Naima wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What is the name of this book? The name of this book is called A Commentary on Sahih al Bukhari. A Commentary on Sahih al Bukhari, um, Volume 1, Beginning of Revelation and Belief by Sheikh Omar Subhidar. Okay, so can I write it in the chat? Yes, of course. Commentary on Sahih al Bukhari, Volume 1, Beginning of Revelation and Belief by Sheikh Omar Subedar, who is from Toronto, fellow Canadian. Allahu Akbar. Okay. Uh, what motivated Heraclius to torture messengers such as Abdullah ibn Hudhafa? You know, subhanAllah, this is a, a fascinating question. I, I, I can't say for sure 100% what the motivation was. But one thing that we see over time is when people know the truth and they end up rejecting it, subhanAllah, their aversion to the truth becomes so much greater. Sort of like when you see ex-Muslims, they leave Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us and keep us steadfast and our families and our friends and loved ones. I mean, their aversion to Islam becomes so much stronger. They can't let go of their Islamic identity. They constantly have to talk about how evil Islam is. So similarly, I think that is what happened, that his knowing of the truth and aversion to it um, made him punishment, the likes of Abdullah bin Hudafa. And just as a, as a side note, you know, the hadith of Abdullah bin Hudafa being uh, put in the hot cauldron of oil, there is uh, some uh, weakness in the hadith itself. So inshallah, I mean, it, it's, it's allowed for the sake of, of sharing uh, for Sira and, and history, but um, to establish any form of lesson from it, I think that's something that we should uh, refrain from, just as a point of benefit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, where can we get it from? It's available online. So just do a, a Google search for it. And I'm pretty sure Islamic Bookstore has it, uh, along with some other online bookstores. Sara wa Iyaki. Bin Khattab wa Iyak. Sara, Amin. Alhamdulillah. Khair, if there's no other questions, we'll conclude with that. You have been an absolutely wonderful, amazing group of students. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and grant you all the best of this life and the next. And grant you the tawfiq to continue your studies and excel in your studies. And may he protect your sincerity and grant you the ittiba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the pious predecessors that followed righteousness. Allahumma ameen. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites us in another class together so that we can benefit from one another. If not, then we are united in Jannah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and all the righteous scholars of hadith that we have benefited from immensely in this class. Ameen ya Rabb. Ameen ya Rabb. Ameen ya Rabb. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته